Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. It's great to see you guys. Merry Christmas. Uh, Well, we're going to continue on in worship through the reading of the Word. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Isaiah chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, the ushers are walking down now. Uh, You're welcome to keep one of those if you have a friend that doesn't have one or you don't have one. That's a gift to you. Uh, So Isaiah chapter 9, while you're turning there, uh, for those of you that don't know me by way of quick introduction, my name is Mike DeStefano. I am uh, currently a seminary student up in Boston at Gordon-Conwell. And... uh, But before I was there, I was here for three years on staff. And so uh, it's a joy to be back here among family, to worship with you guys, to see familiar faces out in the crowd. And I've gotten to to see a lot of people, hug a lot of people since I've been here. And uh, I'm just excited to be back with family. Uh, And I'm grateful for all the things that God is is doing. If I'd have known that he was doing so many things, I would have waited another six minutes to come out uh, rather than just stand here awkwardly and take a knee. Uh, But uh, I'm I'm glad to be back uh, among you guys. It was Faith Bridge that taught me, equipped me, and then commissioned me, sent me off to the great white north uh, to study the things of God and um, freeze my tail off. Uh, So it's good to be back. But uh, if you've got your Bible open to Isaiah chapter 9, let's let's read it together. Uh, If not, it'll be up on the screen. I'm sorry. I told you the wrong chapter. Isaiah chapter 2. Flip over. Kill more time. You guys aren't going to believe what I just did. It's Isaiah chapter (laughs) 9. Starting in verse 2. So, Just keeping you on your toes, everybody. Getting you in that word. All right, Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2, says this. "Uh, The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of the oppressor you have broken as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for an opportunity to gather just as your people, as your family, uh, or as those who are seeking you um, here with family. God, I just ask that this morning would be about uh, so much more Uh, than just sitting in a room, singing songs, and hearing a sermon. I I pray that this would be a moment that light would shine into the darkness. Um, God, for those of us that know you, that you would just refill our world and and give us a renewed vision of the light that is your son. And for those of us that don't know you, God, into the deep darkness, would you you penetrate our hearts and fill us with warmth, uh, with love, uh, with joy in your presence. And so, God, I pray that this would be a holy moment to think about you. God, would you increase our love for you and for your people and for this world? pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I moved to Boston about six months ago, and as you can imagine, coming from the deep south up to the heart of New England requires some cultural adjustments. Uh, The first thing that I really had to get used to were the accents. Uh, If you've ever been there, you know that everyone really does talk exactly like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck from the movie Good Will Hunting, which was one of the first movies that I watched when I got there just to make myself feel at home. Uh, But you kind of have to get used to that, right? Ever since, I mean, since I've been here already, I've gotten a lot of practicas and khakis. And uh, so if you want to show off your Boston accent, maybe use a different phrase because that's everybody's kind of go-to. Just impress me with something else. Uh, The second thing that I've had to get used to is sort of the kindness quotient, right? From the South, we're sort of known for for Southern hospitality, warm personalities, not necessarily so up in the North, at least in public, right? The more annoyed you are and disinterested you seem, the more comfortable people feel in your presence. And uh, that took some some getting used to on my part. Uh, The third thing that I had to adjust to was the public transportation system, right? Nobody drives their own personal car there because the streets are are too wacky and there's too many people. And so you just take the train in. It's a lot easier. Uh, This learning curve proved to be the most crucial. 
Uh, because when I got up there, my first week, my first Saturday in town, a couple of friends from my undergraduate experience went up there to celebrate their two-year wedding anniversary. They had a free night, so they invited me to come to dinner with them, which I was excited to do. So I went downtown, took the train, uh, and then it was time for me to leave. And when I got to the train station, I showed up and uh, I bought my ticket for the 11.30 train out of Boston. So I was there pretty late, uh, but I thought that's just when the train left, apparently because I did not understand how to read the train card. Uh, because I'm looking everywhere for the Newburyport line to take me home, and there's no train. And so I go up to the guy at the ticket counter, and I'm like, hey, buddy, train's not here. You got a problem. And he's like, actually, no, you got a problem, because that train left 30 minutes ago. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> Give me a second, right? And so I just sort of like pull aside, and I'm like, and I'm stuck here. Uh, not sure what I'm going to do. And so I start sort of like weighing my options, and I'm like, well, my friends have their hotel about five minutes from here on foot, but they're celebrating their two-year wedding anniversary, <laughs> and they're probably not playing board games tonight, so what are my options? Uh, and so I just sort of weighed my options, what's legitimately in front of me, and I was like, well, I can, I can sleep here at the train station with that nice homeless man, or I can take a parallel line, get as close as I possibly can, and then walk the distance. So I decided to go that route. That seemed like the best route to me at the time. And so I get on the train, and I'm looking at my walking route that I'll need to take from point A to point B, and just as I sort of take a mental screenshot of it, I, my phone dies. And so I'm out of battery, and I'm just going to be lost in the dark, right? And so I get off the train, and I kid you not, I take 30 steps, maybe 30 paces into the darkness to begin my journey when I hear someone scream for help somewhere behind me, which is incredibly unsettling <laughs> in the dark. And I take off down the main drag, and no joke, walking down the main drag, as soon as I start down, I flipped up my hoodie, and I got my to-go box of food, and I start jogging because I figure I can knock a two-hour walk into, you know, uh, like one-third of that in time if I jog. And as I'm jogging, a police car drives by. And I thought, I better not be a suspect here. So I dropped the hood, and uh, I decided to continue on foot. And I eventually catch up to that car and another police car that I'd seen come and, and sort of meet and go on. And they had stopped the fight, and they were met there by an ambulance because there were six or so young men who had fought two older men, both very muscular, one of them shirtless, the other one being put onto the ambulance. So it seems that they got the upper hand. And as I'm taking all this in, I realize I have to continue on my way. And so I'm looking to see which direction I go. I'm looking for Tozer Road, and I see Tozer Road, and it happens to be the road that shirtless took off down <laughs> because it's the darkest road. It's the darkest option, right? And apparently he felt most comfortable there. And so I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? And so I take off walking down this road and there's no street lights, middle of nowhere, New England. And I eventually get up to a bridge that looks like it's about from the Revolutionary War era. Couldn't really see it. It was pretty dark outside, trees, brushes growing up around it. And I'm like, I gotta walk underneath that thing. Like for sure he's under there, right? And he's just waiting for me. And so I get up underneath that thing. And as I get underneath it, a car drives over the top of it, which I don't know what that noise is. It was just enough to terrify me to the point where I jumped, nearly hit my head on the top of that bridge. Uh, and just sort of entered into fight or flight mode, you know? But uh, because I was totally defenseless, I pretty much just said a few bad words and nearly fainted uh, at that point. Um, and I discovered something that night as I was walking, and that is very simply that there is something terrifying about the unknown of darkness. There is an inherent fear in the heart of every human being to be scared of the shadows, right? And the second thing that I learned that night is that Though we are naturally scared of it, that which is evil or opposed to the justice system finds its home most readily in it. It will run to it. And so the darkness, being in the dark and, and not knowing where you are, is a scary place to be. And so I continued my journey, made it through without meeting him. I eventually landed into a more well-lit area where a policeman had pulled over, uh, I thought for me, maybe to give me a ride. But when he didn't offer that, I went for my plan B in my head, and I asked him if maybe he could call me a cab to take me home, and he asked me where I was going, and he just kind of laughed, and he was like, ha, ah, it's not that far, and then just let me go. <laughs> and he walked into the 24-hour roast beef shop that he'd pulled over for in the first place. Not for me. And, uh, and I learned that night the terror of darkness and sometimes the incredible unhelpfulness of the authority system. Uh, but that's just incidental. Uh, but so um, I mentioned that to you for this reason, because in the dark, a scary place, a tight place, a terrifyingly unknown reality is where we find uh, the people that Isaiah is writing to this morning. If you were to go back one chapter and start reading in chapter eight, you would see words and phrases like no dawn, 
deep darkness, thick darkness, and the fearful gloom of anguish. For Isaiah's people, the Israelites, there was terror without and there was terror within. They were in a land of deep darkness. Just to put it in historical context for you for just a minute, the, the, the people of Israel had two real strongholds because of the division, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And at this point in the, the history of the nation, uh, they had been engaging in practices that were sort of crumbling it from the inside, inside, deteriorating it, if you will. And as that was happening, a force from the outside, the Assyrians, came against it. And the Assyrians, if you know anything about them, you know that they were a wicked, cruel people. One commentator called them the cruelest, most vile empire on the planet. Uh, the prophet Nahum in our Old Testament called them the city of cruelty known for their blood. And so they go and they wipe out the northern kingdom. And after they wipe out the northern kingdom, they begin to march south. And the people in the south are terrified, as you can imagine. But not just because there's terror without, but because there's terror within. Because they understood that on their throne sat the worst king in Israel's history. If you know anything about their history, King Ahaz um, instituted pros uh, temple prostitution, child sacrifice, was a selfish, wicked man. No hope from within and no hope from without. It was a bad place to be. It was a bad place to be. And so the prophet Isaiah, who God sent to communicate his heart to them, is going to diagnose the problem. And he's going to tell them that if this is basically, uh, people of God, this is basically a heart issue. Uh, the problem beneath your problem, the conflict that got you into this mess in the first place, is really a conflict between divine glory and human pride, that within the heart of every human being is a tendency or propensity to resist the leadership of God and to elevate ourselves as number one. Uh, that we will treat me as the center of the universe. And the problem with that is that it's offensive to God and it's destructive to humanity. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that real quickly because there's a lot of people that I know and I've had this thought that we wonder why does God care if I treat myself as number one, if I look out for me? Uh, like, I'm not bothering him, I'm living my life. What does it matter to him if I don't treat him as number one but I treat me as number one? Uh, well, let me try to explain it to you this way. There was a period of time between moving uh, from Houston to Boston in which I finished up my job at Faithbridge and was living with the McGowns because my lease expired on my rental home. So they said, why go find a new place? Just live here for a couple of months and hang out with us. And Brian McGowan is the executive pastor here at Faithbridge. And, uh, and he trusted me, brought me into his home to live life with them uh, and to, to share meals with them and to play with his kids and to just be a part of their world. And it was awesome. Uh, just personally for me, it was, uh, it was a wonderful time. It was a little gym in my history as I got to watch them love one another, parent their kids with, with affection and with strength. And it was just this really cool moment that they trusted me to enter into. Uh, now, there was a period of time uh, during those two months that I lived there that Brian left the country, went to the Philippines uh, for a week. And he trusted me there alone with his family. Now, imagine if during that time I decided, you know what? I kind of like it here. This is nice stuff. You know what? This is my stuff now. Brian's not in charge anymore. I am. And uh, that's a nice pool. That's my pool. That's a nice master bedroom. That's my master bedroom, right? This is a nice house. I'm taking this. Uh, and it, imagine if I just rose up and said, you know what, I like this stuff. This is my stuff now. And I did whatever I wanted with his stuff and with his family. How do you think Brian would feel upon finding out that that was the case? My guess is that they would make a movie about it later. Maybe star Liam Neeson in it, right? Like he was gonna come in and wreck shop. You know what I mean? Like that's his stuff. That's not my stuff. I don't get to do that with his stuff. And the Bible is teaching us that we are not our own. This is not our own. We didn't make any of this. We just were born into it. And, and not only would I be wrong to do that to the McGowns, I would be doing a great offense to the creator of the family and the actual owner of the stuff. And so in that sense, when we rise up and we say, you know what, this is mine. I'm gonna do with it whatever I want regardless. God hates that. Don't do that. And the second thing that we learn is that not only is it offensive to God, but it's destructive to humanity and it's destructive to yourself. See, the, the book of Isaiah is gonna teach us that, um, that God is the source of light. That's the metaphor that it plays with most often in regards to God. God is the central source of light. And if you're to play that metaphor out in your mind and you were imagine, to imagine a scenario where there was one central source of light, if you're to be near that light, you're in the light. If you're to walk away from the light, you're walking into darkness, right? That's the nature of it. It's inherent in it that if we're near the light, we're, uh, if we're near the light, uh, that we're in the light. If we move away from it, we move into darkness. And so to walk away from light is to walk into darkness. To walk away from goodness, or, I'm sorry, to walk away from goodness and mercy is to walk away or walk into 
um, wickedness and cruelty. To, to be near God and then to walk away from God. That's the picture that it paints. That when we're near to him, we're near to life and light. When we move away from him, we move into darkness and death. And that's the nature of sin. And God doesn't want that. He hates that. And so he calls us to himself. Come stand in the light. Your sin is offending God and it's killing you. And so he sends Isaiah the prophet to communicate to them his heart. Don't walk away from me. It's not good for you. And, um, and, and in this moment, Isaiah is writing to a people that terrible disaster has fallen upon. That the north has gone down, the south is falling. I was in London uh, in May of 2012, and you can go to the British Museum there, and you can see actual records from this period, from the Assyrian king Sennacherib. Uh, and you can see a, a stone carving from this period of King Jehu of the north bowing down uh, to King Sennacherib. And you can read in his journal, etched into stone, where he says, I had the southern kingdom, Judah, Ahaz, trapped like a bird in a cage. And you can go read about this. This is not a good moment for the people of God. And what's interesting about that is really two sort of camps emerged from within the people as they were trapped in darkness and they were trapped in terror. The first were those that thought, you know what, maybe my faith, all this that I believed about God and his goodness and his promises, maybe it's a farce because this doesn't seem to be going too well. And maybe he's not even really there. And the second group, to them, God was real enough, but he had promised that if they walked away from him, disaster would come, disaster is here, and so he's abandoned us. He's real, but he's gone. And, uh, and I think some of us have maybe been there before. Maybe you've had that thought when the darkness closes in around your life that either God's not real or he doesn't love me. Not really. And that's where they find themselves. Uh, and just to tip my cards to you, uh, the point at the beginning of this sermon is just to get you thoroughly depressed, okay? Uh, so Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, but if I'm gonna be faithful to this passage and where Isaiah is taking us, I need to address the darkness because that's exactly how he describes this moment. He says, there are people who lived in a land of deep darkness. Um, and he's gonna go on to describe that darkness and he's gonna tell us that... Uh, uh, it's thick, it's deep. Or in one translation, he'll render it. They live in a land that lies in death's shadow, death's shadow. And so it's a thick, overwhelming darkness. And some of you don't really need my help to think dark thoughts, right? Uh, the Christmas season especially can be hard for some people. Um, the National Center for Health Statistics indicates a 15% spike in the number of people that seek help for, for emotional disorders in the month of December. Uh, one scholarly article said, said it this way, holiday depression can be caused by a number of factors, including unrealistic expectations, financial pressures bearing down on you, and overcommitment. For those without friends, family, or support system, the holidays can bring about sadness, self-reflection, loneliness, anxiety. And some of you feel this right? Uh, that it feels like as we walk into a season that's supposed to be bright and happy and chipper, it just feels like a mockery to your actual internal state. You walk out of Kroger, someone with a nice Santa hat and a bell wishes you Merry Christmas, and you're like, Merry Christmas, right? And it's just like, can't handle it. Just feels like a joke. Um, and some of you live there. Some of you, that's where you are right now. But the reality is the darkness goes much deeper than that in the land that we live in. The book of Ecclesiastes sums up this world in this way. The author says, next I turn my attention to the outrageous violence that takes place on this planet. Tears of the victims, no one to comfort them. The iron grip of oppressors, no one to rescue the victims from their hand. So he says, so I congratulated the dead who are already dead instead of the living who are still alive. But then he goes on to say, but luckier than the dead and the living are those who have never been born so that they never have to see the terrible things that happen on this planet. That's a pretty grim assessment of where we live on planet Earth, right? And it seems a little bit harsh until you turn on the news or pull up USA Today on your browser and read about 123 kids who were killed by terrorists and the, the horror that their families must have gone through. Or you read about a man who was in a family dispute in, in Pennsylvania in the Quaker state that as a response to that dispute murdered six people in his family. Uh, recently, I read an article on the proliferation of, of rape culture in American fraternities uh, with a clenched fist. And I watched a video of a man being choked to death, defenseless, with tears in my eyes. This is indeed a land of thick darkness. We do live in death's shadow. But we are not without hope. 
just as Isaiah's people were not without hope. And the reason why we start here, the reason why he started there was so that he could, with his writings, take the people by their hand and lead them into a place where they could see, they could know, they could experience the depth of their depravity that they were being rescued from so that they could feel the impossibility of joy, that they could feel gratitude on the deepest level. He wanted them to experience resurrection and the depth of that. When he wrote to them, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light and the people who, land, who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And I love the way that he describes that moment, the coming of the light. He says, on them a light has shone. Not that they found it, not that they were wandering in the dark and they were like, oh, a light switch and it turned on, but they were lost in the dark and the light found them. The light has shone on them, not heard about it, not maybe hoped that it would come. It came and it found them and it shone on them that a bright and hopeful light has penetrated their darkness and made their eyes shine. Right? That's a beautiful imagery. Uh, that those who lived in fear and dread, sunbursts of light in the dawn. That's the image that he wants us to grab. And he goes on to, to continue to describe the effects of this light, this light. And he says it this way in verse 3. He says, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Uh, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. And he starts off and he says, you've multiplied the nation. You've increased the joy, even in the midst of darkness. And I love that because Isaiah is going to teach us that God will use even darkness to make things that are beautiful. You have used even oppression like a wine press to take raw materials, press it down and make something good and satisfying. You've increased its joy, he says. When this light comes, they will rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. And they are glad in your presence when they divide the spoil. And I love that because he conjures up two images, images of feasting, that you would sit at a table full of the choicest and most abundant of food with the best of friends and the fullest of laughter. And then he says, and they are glad as when they divide the spoil. And this imagery is war imagery, that there's been a great victory. Maybe nearer to our minds would be the image of the confetti falling at the Super Bowl, right? Or an NBA team after the final spraying the champagne in the locker room, that there is great celebration because there is great victory when this joy comes. And he says, when this light shines, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced. It's going to bring joy. And so the question that we have to ask as we go out is, how does this happen? For those of you that live in darkness, that understand this, that feel this on a deep heart level, and you know this because of your experiences, how do we get to a place where there's feasting and there's victory in your heart and it's real? How do we get there? This text is going to give us three, four clauses. Four, the word F-O-R gives us reason. So three reasons to be truly joyful this Christmas. And the first one is going to come in verse four where he writes this. <clears throat> For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. And so he talks first about the yoke of your burden, the staff of your shoulder. If you don't know what a yoke is, a yoke was something that you put on an animal or a slave for agricultural work. And as you begin to push against that yoke, it would bear down on you and it was known as a great burden. But he's gonna call it the yoke of your burden. And um, what he's trying to communicate is there's a burden that you bear on your back that's weighing you down, that's killing you, and it's the weight of your sin, Israel. You've become enslaved to it. You can't get out from underneath it. And he's going to talk about that yoke of their shoulder. And then he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just address the yoke of their shoulder. He addresses the rod of their oppressor. And so he's going to address what's on their shoulder and he's going to address what's coming against them with the rod. And this is not what you've done, but this is what's been done to you. And a lot of you live in this place where you can't get out of your mind the terrible things that you've done. But more than that, you can't get out of your mind the terrible things that have been done to you. Certain seasons or events or particular things that happen to you in your life have come to define who you are. Nearly your every thought you're consumed with, the rod of the oppressor. And Isaiah is going to look at that and he's going to say both the, the yoke of the burden, that which you've done, and the rod of the oppressor, that which has been done to you, you, God, the light that shines, are going to remove them and break them both. That a great light is going to shine into our darkness and a strong hand is going to come to snap that which defines us. That no longer defines you, he's going to say. That it's not true of you anymore. And I love the way that this plays out because for Isaiah, in this particular verse, there's three parties. There's you and that which you've done. 
There's someone else and that which they've done to you. And then into that mess, a third party arrives and it's God. And when he shows up, he takes both of those things and he snaps them and he brings great victory and rejoicing. Those things are no longer true of you. And then we're gonna move into the second four clause or the second reason that this joy is gonna come with such pronounced victory. And it's in verse five when he says, for every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Uh, that first, first little phrase that he uses, for every boot of the tramping warrior and battle tumult. So he's talking about the guy's foot. And what's interesting about that is the literal translation, Hebrew, it doesn't say all those words. It just says for every boot, Booting with shaking, which I tried to picture in my mind, what is the author trying to communicate? And I think what he's talking about is someone that is shaking in their boots, that the battle has come against you, that you're standing and you're fighting and you're fearful and you're frantic and you're in the rage of battle, that you're shaking in your boots, right? He's going to address that. And the second thing he's going to address is every garment rolled in blood. And what he's trying to say is when the battle does come against you and it comes knocking at your door and it lets itself in, so to speak, and you're surrounded by it, when you are found in that battle, you will go to war and you will create hurt. That man, when it rises up, you get angry, you get fearful, and you start to cut down. And he says that stained your clothes. That stained your clothes with blood. And you're guilty. And you know that. And you feel that. And Isaiah's gonna say for every boot, and every garment that's rolled in blood that you've rolled up and it's waiting for you tomorrow and you feel the weight of that, he says, all of that, all of that will be burned as fuel for the fire. I love that imagery because he says, I'm gonna take all that, all that you've done and all that's been done to you and we're gonna put it in the fire and it's gonna disappear, disintegrate. And the beauty of God's redemption is that even the things that we've done that are hurtful are gonna add to the light of the fire. But the beauty of God's redemption is that he is, is, is beautiful and can redeem and, and make new. And if, you're, if you've been following, these two verses sort of follow this outline or this parallel that he's trying to communicate. He says, the rod of the oppressor, the, or I'm sorry, the weight of your burden, the rod of the oppressor, the boot of battle tumult, and then the garment uh, that's rolled in blood. And so basically it's all that you've done and all that's been done to you, and then all that's been done to you and all that's been done, and all that you've done. All of it, all of it, everything, gone. He says, that's what the light does. It shines into the darkness, and it removes that which has come to define us, and that which has come to make us fearful. And so all that begs the question, how? Some of you who are critical thinkers go, that sounds a little bit too good to be true, right? And we don't just need another Bible verse to sort of do patchwork to our pain. We don't need another religious platitude or another well wish. What we need and what Isaiah is going to do is he's going to move from the metaphorical to the historical. This is not some spiritual, ethereal, um, you know, wouldn't that be nice? This is objective, historical hope. Hope. God entering into human history kind of hope. He's going to move from the metaphorical to the historical when he gives us the final reason the one that makes the others true. For unto us, a child is born. To us, a son has been given. And authority will be on his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He said, this isn't just gonna be another spiritual thought. This is gonna be history. God's going to come to you and he's going to change everything with his nearness. And he's going to come not in human pride and pomp and power. He's going to come in humility as a baby. And he's going to be a candidate for, for kingship. And the government, the authority for all of it is going to be on his shoulder. And he'll take up our cause. And he's not just going to be an authority figure He's going to be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. And I love that because he says, these are the things you're going to say about him. Once you really know him, and once his light shines into your world, you're going to call him wonderful counselor, translated wonder of a counselor. And maybe you have people like that in your life that you're like, man, you are a wonder of a counselor. Like, how do you know exactly what I need to hear to give me wisdom to live? 
I don't know if you have anybody like that in your life. If you don't, I highly suggest it. Uh, for me, uh, the guy that's probably the best counselor in my life is a prophet by the name of Dan Slagle. Uh, he just knows everything that's going on in my life all the time, and he just speaks directly into it. It's crazy. He's sort of known by some of the younger guys on staff affectionately as Yoda or Dandolf for his wisdom. <laughs> Uh, just because he can kind of see into our hearts and just give us this amazing counsel that's perfect for me, right? And we've, uh, he's taken me all over the world on mission. And so he knows me. He knows my success and my failure. And he just speaks in and gives me the right steps, the right wisdom to live my life in a way that's life-giving and not tearing down, right? And what's beautiful about this passage is he's saying God is going to be that for you. He'll give you wisdom for living. And he's going to be near enough to you to know what to say. And you're gonna be near enough to him to hear it and to follow. He's gonna be a wonder of a counselor and he's gonna be mighty God. I love that because he's not just gonna know what to say, he's gonna have the power to do something about it. He's able, he's God. And then he's called everlasting father, everlasting father. That he's not gonna be authority figure in in the sense of a politician or, or somebody with something to gain from that moment. He's gonna be the authority figure in the sense of a father of a dad, that he's going to be invested in you in love and in life and in everything, inseparable. I'm a father to you. But then it calls him Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. And he's he's communicating there's going to be something about him that's fatherly in his love for you, but he's not going to be the father. He's going to be the son. He's going to be the prince. And he's going to come to you in the name of the father, and he's going to bring you ultimately and climactically peace, peace for your soul. The gospel writer Luke, and this is where we'll close, records for us how this first shone on the hearts of humankind. Um, In history, at a moment of space and time, he's going to record this moment, and it's going to come to some shepherds. And he says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. And I love that record of what happened in that moment, that there's shepherds out in the field surrounded by darkness And a light that is brighter and purer than the sun comes in and scares the daylights out of them, right? And why were they terrified? I think it's because they had no way to cover up. They had no way to hide. And somehow that light seemed to shine directly into their hearts. Jonathan Parnell helps us uh, with some insight into this moment when he says, but we also remember that there isn't only darkness out there. If we know our own hearts, we know it gets dark in here too. So not only must the gospel the good news of Jesus advance in distance, it must advance also in depth. Jesus came to make his blessing flow as far as the curse is found. That means out there among the highways and hedges of this world and in here, among the nooks and crannies of our soul. And when that light light shone into their souls, it says they were terrified. They were terrified. Uh, But the angels, knowing their frame, give them this beautiful command, and they look at them and they say, fear not. This is good news, great joy. And um, I imagine that for these Jewish shepherds, they would have remembered the boy that Isaiah talked about. And the angels are communicating to them, hey, you know the one that's coming that's gonna bring great victory and great joy as like feasting? He's gonna be called Emmanuel, the very presence of God with you? He's here. He's born to you. This isn't a fearful moment. This is a joyful moment. He's God with you, for you. When the devastating light of heaven faded that night, one pastor said, they understood that it was still shining in a stable not far away, contained in the form of a baby. The very light of God had arrived, not only to penetrate the darkness, but to sweep it away altogether. When he was grown, those who stood nearby would see glimpses of the light he carried on a mountain, in a river, by a tomb. He would shine the light of God on those who knew they dwelt in darkness, exposing the sin and death inside, but he would do more. He would lean forward into the dark hearts of his people and he would light them up from the inside. Flames of fire would rest on their heads and the warmth of God's light would settle 
and their hearts. And when that happens, verse 7 teaches us that his authority will know no end. The peace will know no end. He'll establish his throne with justice. He'll relieve the oppressed and with righteousness. He'll be good and holy, and it's never ending. Um, so last story, I uh, came across a video last Christmas. It went viral in December um, about a, uh, a man who was a cook on a ship. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Probably so. Uh, it went viral, but it's this amazing video of these rescuers who are searching inside of this ship that had gone down, and, and they had given up the whole crew for, for lost. They'd already pulled four corpses out of the water. And so this guy's swimming out underneath, and he's looking for another body to recover for their family so they could know finally where they were. And as he's swimming around, a hand grabs his. And at first, the dude freaks out. Uh, and then the next thing you hear is, he's alive, he's alive. And you see just the light of this flashlight shining in this guy's eyes. And when he would recount that moment later, the cook that was on the ship, he would say, I was stuck in there for nearly three days in total darkness, and I just knew the end was coming. And he survived for nearly three days on nothing but a, a bottle of Coke, right? It's like a, the most amazing Coke ad ever. Uh, and he's <laughs> down there uh, just sort of making it. And he said, the whole time I was down there, I was replaying the words in my mind of a text that my wife had sent me the night before the ship went down, and it was out of Psalm 54, and it talks about God as our deliverer and our rescuer. And he said, as soon as I saw that light, I reached for it. I jumped in the water out of my air pocket, and I swam towards it, and he was rescued. And the beauty of that moment is it gives us a, a perfect picture into who God is for us, that we're trapped in the darkness, no hope, no way out, wouldn't even know the way to go. And if we were to get out, and so he comes, his light finds us, it rescues us, and it changes everything. He pulls us out, gives us new life, new love. We've been rescued, and that changes everything. Um, so let me pray for us. Well, Father, um, I just ask that as we consider who you are in the light of your presence, God, for, for a lot of us, we know the terror of being exposed in the light, um, that not all is right here. But God, I pray that you would just sink deep into our hearts this reality that your light is bright and purifying, and when you shine into our lives, it is not a fearful moment, it's a joyful moment, that you come to break the yoke, to burn up the guilty stains, and to set free those who have been oppressed that you would relieve the darkness and you would set our hearts right again. And God, for those who um, need this hope desperately but have yet to find it, I, I just pray that they would go on a journey to, to discover the historical Jesus, a real man who came to change this world unlike any other human being that ever lived, who was not just a man, but he was mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. God, would you shine into the darkness of this world in us and through us and may spring in the world never look the same because of the transforming power of your gospel, of your light. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript from FaithBridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with returning Bible teacher, Mike DeStefano. Welcome back. Thank you. It's Glad to, to have back. you back. So let's just start by telling us, giving us an update on where you are. And well, um... I, uh, I'm up in Boston going to Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, uh, just sort of starting the seminary journey, and uh, it's been amazing. It's a beautiful campus. It was a former monastery. I'm enjoying your pictures. And plantation home. Oh, and so, fun. yeah, it's gorgeous. And just fantastic professors, wonderful students, and uh, it's been awesome. It's That's been a really good. cool Well, we're certainly season. glad to have you back over the holidays. Yeah, yeah. And enjoyed your message today as we prepare for the celebration of Christ. Yeah. And so I'm um, just going to jump into a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about two responses that the Israelites had. Mm -hmm. um, one, the response being to just not believe in God, or two, 
to believe in God, but him just not be real to you. Like, sure. like he's abandoned me, I'm in despair. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I can think of many people who probably reach that point of despair to saying, God, where are you in this? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the response? How do we respond in times like that? Yeah, well, it's interesting to watch it play out in, in the lives of the Israelites as they feel like God has abandoned them or that their faith was just a farce in the first place. Um, and I just think that is so applicable because I've had that thought. One of the two, you know, like doesn't feel like he's real to me, doesn't feel like he cares, doesn't feel like he loves me. And to watch there, so we're sort of, we meet him in, the, in that present moment and that's where we are. But what we get to do is we get to look at their lives and see how did it play out for them? Mm -hmm. Like what did it look like uh, and what will it look like for us? And so uh, it's interesting because the primary response to those two uh, camps was to say, okay, well, God either is not here or he doesn't care. And so the temptation was to, to worship the Babylonian and the Assyrian gods, which we probably won't do. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not gonna pull out a Babylonian idol and bow down to it. But um, it was tempting for them because they promised success, they promised beauty, they promised um, you know, fruitful fields. And so I think the temptation for us is to go, well, God doesn't seem like he cares. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem like he's near. And so that guy seems to worship his business and he gives everything he has to it. And so I just need to be more like him. Like I, I, I need to, to spend less time here and more time at the office. And I just need to, I need to make money. I need to get a nicer car. And like we start to pursue and worship that which looks like it's making other people happy. And the temptation is to go, well, God, you're not there. And so I'll just chase after this. Um, and we just see that end in destruction. And I, I think a good book to read if you feel like you're there in the Bible, is uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, it really is, is, is written just before, and, uh, and it's just a beautiful book, and it's really helpful with those sorts of questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would just encourage them to, to press into God. Um, he doesn't necessarily promise prosperity, but he does promise his nearness, and that that's better. And that's sufficient. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so um, you've talked about a friend that you have that um, I think we probably all know people like this that um, want to believe in the hope of Christ and the message of what he brings, but at times can still be skeptical of the miracles and sure. the things that happen. Um, tell a little bit about what it looks like to sort of explore Christianity from the historical perspective yeah. when speaking to friends like that. Absolutely. Yeah, that was, uh, someone asked me that question just after the after the uh, second service, and um, it's a good question. I, what I told her was, depending on how you think, I wouldn't try to address that person um, with, come at them with rigor rigorous logic and out-argue them. Like, I think that turns people off. Unless you think that way, and you can love that way. I think the more important thing for her is to just be kind, to love him, and to invite him into the community of God and see its effects. But I also recommended to her a book to give to him because uh, there's a book by Tim Keller. It's called The Reason for God, and it's um, it's very logical, reason oriented. It comes out of a scholastic tradition, and so um, it's just well researched and well done. And it's a fantastic book. Yes. It's just amazing. And the uh, small group study is available for everyone Look through Right Now Media. <laughs> and my small group uh, actually just finished it up at the end of December. We just did lesson six how last well week. Did that work out for and you? that did great. Uh, so yeah. um, it's available if you for anyone who wants to um, read and listen to um, Tim Keller's Absolutely. teachings on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that one would be primary. If they want to go even deeper, uh, I would recommend The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. Um, it it talks about the effects of the resurrection and basically how the Jesus movement isn't possible, especially in its explosive growth in the early days of Christianity without something like the resurrection. And so it, it gives a lot of uh, weight and credence to the historical Jesus. Um, so that's a good place to start. And, uh, and there's several others, but uh, those are the two good ones. Yeah. Great. So. Well, um, certainly was a pleasure to have you back with us yeah. today Super and um, I wish you uh, much continued success as you go back to Boston. So yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We will see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.